What is good, guys? It is your Boston Brit, and we're back with a brand new episode of The Garden Party. Now, we've got a very special guest of us today. Um, but firstly, to introduce my co-host, and that is the basketball ass himself, Mr. Josh Coyne. Josh, you good? I'm good, thank you. Uh, just after receiving my booster, which, for full disclosure, has not necessarily boosted me. But, you know, it's for the greater good, and it's a long game. Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, I, I'm looking uh, feeling positive and glad to be joined by esteemed company today. We, honestly, guys, we have. Should we should we bring him in? Should we bring him in now? Let's bring him in. No one wants to listen to us talk. To be honest, I mean they listen to that every week. So let's bring him in. So our guest today, you played 189 games for the Boston Celtics. Most notably, you will probably remember him for his game two against the Lakers in the 08 series, um, final series, uh, is the one and only Leon Poe. Leon, how are you doing, man? Good. How y'all doing over there? We're good. We're good. We're good. We're, we're getting by. We're getting by. Yeah. Hey, man, I'm happy to be here with the UK, man. I mess with y'all over there. It's all good. All love on our part, especially on the Boston Celtics and, and the fans, especially. Really appreciate it. So- so Leon, to, just to just to jump off the back of what Nathan said, I know that you had a you know had you had a long healthy NBA career, and I know that you do get asked regularly about that one game. But of course, it was a standout moment. Your performance in the two thousand eight game two of the NBA Finals, where you had twenty one points, six from eight, uh, sorry, six from seven, so very efficient. Yeah. And from my point of view, it was a formative moment in my basketball and Celtics fandom. I'd, I'd been a Celtics fan since a child because of my dad. But then, of course, really, as I became a teenager, I got really into it. And then the NBA Finals really sealed the deal in uh, 2008. Yeah. So for anyone who hasn't heard your opinion and your feelings, you know, 14 years later about that Game 2 experience, could you take us through it? Yeah, um... Man, that game two was a long time coming. Um, I put a lot of hard work in. Uh, we, we came a long ways, especially the season before. And people don't realize that. And I, I always try to forget. But we, we lost about 20-something games in a row. And it was a tough year. Uh, the fans and everybody was uh, upset, frustrated. We was all frustrated. Uh, didn't know what direction we was going to do, um, go in. And, you know, uh, we started to get some traction. For the next season, um, some movement, I mean, by we got KG, um, we got Ray Allen. And so stuff started to look good. But before that, you know, I was I was trying to see trying to see where I fit in, you know, and, and, and what was going on with the team and see how I can, you know, assert myself. And, and I was a rookie. And then my second year, going into my second year, we got those guys. And I'll tell you all a little quick story when I. When, when we was getting KG, I was like, man, we're going we gonna to really get KG. That's somebody I looked up to. I, I, you know, I watched when I was growing up, and he, he played with that fire and that intensity that I like. And, and I was happy about it. I was on the beach in the uh, Bahamas. I was real happy. But then again, I said, well, to get a player like that, how many players you got to trade? And it was like, uh, got to trade a lot. And, and, and so, <laughs> so I, I immediately was like, you know what? Y'all don't talk to me until the trade happens. Make sure my name ain't in there. And, uh, you know, little behold, my name wasn't in there. We got KG and we got Ray Allen um, came together as a team. And, and leading up to that game, too, we played hard. We did everything we needed to do um, to win games. And, and that's the best feeling when you can win games. And we got to that moment, that championship moment against the Lakers. It's our rivalry. Uh, they hyped it all the way up too. It was it was it was going down, and we really got to that moment and was like, you know what, we can do this. It's our first year. People doubted us, but we can do this. And leading up to that game two, we won game one, and game two, I came in the game. I had a good feeling about that game. I woke up. I told everybody, and I tell the story all the time. I woke up. I ate the right cereal. It was Frosted Flakes that day, and I felt something. I just felt something kick in when I went to the arena. Uh, everybody was just so nice and, and, and welcoming. And I was like, oh, man, this it might be my day today. And that's how I can tell things like that. And then, you know, Doc always say stay ready. 
uh, stay ready. You don't know when your number's going to get called. Um, sometimes he needs you. Sometimes he might not. And then when your number's called, he expects you to handle your business. And so when I got in there, this was what I trained for. Been doing this my whole life, but trained for that moment. And it was that moment right there that I put it a lot of work in on the beach in the sand with the Navy SEAL. We call our guy. That was my guy, Crazy Frank. Uh, nobody wanted to train up, train with him. Uh, until I was the first crazy guy to train with him and, and everybody tried to follow. So we did that and that brought me back to that moment. And then leading up to game two, it was just, it was just so surreal. It was fun. It was, the atmosphere was great, but I was ready for the moment. When I got in there, it was all business and I was all about my assignment, what I got to do and how I stay ready to get in that moment and, and to attack the Lakers that the way I wanted to attack them. I didn't shoot threes. I wanted to, but I didn't shoot threes and, and I attacked them inside and got to the free throw line a lot. And the rest was history after that. I mean, how, so, did, how, did, how did you, how do you mentally prepare? I mean, being, being, being a young, being a young NBA player, I mean, how do you mentally yeah. prepare yourself for a series like that, where you're going up against the Lakers, oh. against Kobe? I mean, it's, how do you, you know, how, how did you mentally prepare for that? Yeah, it, it, it was, it's, it's tough, man. It's tough. But when I was growing up, man, I, um, you know, um, I didn't have a lot. So what we what we came into games and my team, we came into games, we were telling them, man, look, you got to be the hungriest dude out here. You can't let this dude outwork you. You can't let that dude outwork you. You know why? Because I don't think they hungrier than you. Now, you prove me wrong. They prove me wrong. They outwork you. Then it's your fault. So I always was taught not to let nobody outwork me. So when I went into that game, I said, you know what? The one thing I'm not going to let anybody do on that court is outwork me. I'm going to work the hardest out there. Now, after you get past that part, I had to settle down a little bit because, yes, yeah, a big game. It's a big moment. I played in a few of them already because being on that Celtics team, we played in a lot of big games. But this was the NBA Finals. This was a whole different ball game. And when Doc called my name, I ran up to the scores table. This was not like nothing else. It wasn't even, wasn't even like the playoffs. Ran up to the scores table, and I was trying to get in the game, but the ref pulled me back and was like, hold up, hold up, hold up play we're gonna keep going you get in after this free throw um, um another timeout free throw timeout something like that and so I said all right I sat back and I watched and I was just like oh all the lights the cameras it was just like nothing like no other thing I seen and I was so happy to be there but my nerves start going a little bit but when I when that happened I brought back to when I was in Oakland when I was training by myself training with some of my people telling me this is going to, you're going to have a moment. It's just, you're going to be ready for it. And that's all that I did to calm myself down. Just went back to the time when I was in Oakland, California training. Um, I'm just going to take a quick note, if you don't mind, I've got my pen and paper because I've got some yeah. rec, rec league games next year. So just okay. one, so just, just one second. Frosted flakes. How, how Frost. much? They're like a big bowl? No, you got to have a big bowl with the big spoon. You cannot have the little bowl. I okay. don't have the little ball. <laughs> okay. In, inside the mind of an athlete. I love that. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. You touched upon your story. It's not like many others. Um, yeah. And I remember watching the game 3 a.m. here, you know, on the, uh, the, yeah. the fixtures in L.A. Uh, I remember a lot of the broadcast that we were getting, I, I believe, was from either ABC or, or ESPN, but filtered yes. through. And your remarkable personal background was really woven into the broadcast after your game two performance, especially. Um, yeah. how, how aware of you that that was happening and that noise and that uh, kind of media attention was starting to increase? Um, I was aware of it. I didn't, I didn't know about everything, but I was aware of it. I'll give you a quick story about, you know, they was going to run a story on me during uh, the playoffs. I knew that. And, uh, and a little bit about my background, where I came from, and uh, things like that. But I didn't know when they was going to run it. And so we went to a game seven, first round with the eight seed. Shouldn't have did that, but they played hard. Give them credit. They played hard. They fought. Uh, they made them shots to win those games at, they, at their house. And so ESPN called me, and they said, you know what? Y'all might lose. We're going to have to run this story. You're going to have to run it uh, probably today or tomorrow. We're going to have to run it. I told him, don't run the story. We're not going to lose. That's how confident I was. We're not going to lose. I said, 
what we do, we put a lot of work in to get home field, home court advantage. And, and when we got that, it's for a reason. And now we got a game seven on our home court. They got to beat us on our home court, which they haven't done. And not too many people done throughout the whole season. So I was real confident of that. So they said, all right, we're going to trust you. But if this thing, if y'all lose, this ain't not, this can't get ran. It's, it's not going to get ran. I was like, I said, okay, I'm, it's fine with me. But I know where we're going. I know where we're headed. We're going to the championship. And that's why I told ESPN. I didn't tell nobody else that. That was just our little, our little secret, our little story. And um, and when I was in the gang, uh, gang two especially, um, I didn't know at the start. I didn't know all the media attention at the start. Um, but when I was coming back to the locker room, I seen my face on TV talking, and I remember that's the interview. So I was like, oh, they, and they run in the interview right now. I said, man, I'll tell you, just my lucky day. I'm telling you, it, it was a good day. You ate them frosted flakes. You wake up on the right side of the bed, the cool side of the pillow everything is good and that's what I thought man I was like you know what it's all falling into place but I had to stay focused because I always we all, we got a job at hand a task at hand to do especially with coached by Doc Rivers he expects you to do his job do the job no matter what who's in the game he wants you to show he wants you to cover play defense that's what I did get to the open spots if KG getting doubled or Pete Paul getting doubled Ray getting doubled you better get to the open spots because if you're not there it's your fault it's not their fault. It's your fault. So I made sure I paid attention to details too as well. But I knew the media coverage, the extra media coverage. So I, obviously, as you mentioned, the Hawks did kind of stretch you in the first round. Um, would you say that that was a widespread shared belief? It sounds like it certainly was from any stories I've heard is that across the roster, that kind of, no, 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 this is, not, this is just the start of this postseason journey. That was a widespread belief amongst the team. Yeah, that was that was a widespread belief amongst the whole team. We 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 felt, you know, we was gonna win the championship that year. Um, we felt that we had the team to do it. We felt that we was the better team throughout the year, throughout the regular season. We was a better road team than anybody. We just couldn't get a road win on, in the first round, and and we looked at that as a challenge. We said, okay, we're not getting no win, but we know we can get a road win at some point. We're gonna get one. But we can't give up home home court. And that's what we pride ourselves on too as well. We like going to other people's houses and beat them. That that gives us ultimate pleasure. But if that didn't happen, we got to take care of business at home. And that's what we did. And everybody knew what, what was going on uh, when we got back to the house. Well, it sounds like you kind of en encapsulate an incredible next man up attitude and you really like embraced your role within that team because you know what the end goal could have possibly been um yeah. do you now pay specific attention to role players on the boston celtics particularly as somebody who knows how important it is to be ready for that call oh yeah i, I look at all role players man all role players have an important role mm -hmm. um sometimes you might not play every night you might not start you might not um get the minutes you want you might not get the looks you want and, and, and an example is, I was in the championship game. I think it was the game we came back from 26 down. I don't know what game it was. I don't know if it was game four, maybe. Maybe game four or game five, something like that in L.A. because we had the 2-3-2 two, two rule, and I don't, I don't like that at all, 2-3-2. No, it's, two. it's better now. It's, 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 it's terrible. I didn't like it at all. But we had to deal with it. We had three road games in a row with Kobe and the Lakers, we, you know, it's not a pleasant thing to be doing, but doc, this, this is an example of how doc, he don't care. He, he, he'll call your number, but he expect you to be ready for it. I didn't touch the ball that whole game, like at all. I was just playing defense, rebound, trying to do some, get some rebound, doing all the little dirty work, um, guarding people. And then we got into the huddle. We was down 26 that game. And that was a game Eddie House, James Posey, Ray Allen, and then brought us back by shooting all those threes. And we got into the huddle, and we was down by like four, I believe. It was, no, we was down by like six. And, and it was like two and a half minutes to go, and we needed every bucket from there on out because we was like, we need every bucket. So we got in the huddle. Doc brought us in, and, and, and KG was like, man, we need a bucket. Okay, where are we going? We went to Ray. We're doing this. Uh, we're going to. I, and Doc was like, we might do a KG post up. No, we're not doing that. Um, Paul Pierce was like, well, just give it to me on a wing, on a clear out. I got this all day. And he was like, 
nah, we're not doing that. He said, you know what we're going to do, fellas? You know what we're going to do? We're going to give Leon a clear out. And everybody looked around and said, what? We're going to give... We're going to give Leon a clear out. You know why? Because he, I think Lamar Odom is the weakest link on, you know, the defender on this, on the, on the, uh, the floor. I think he can go at him much as y'all can go at the other people, but they, they got a heck of a link too. Lamar do too, but I think he can get him just for this possession. I think he got him. And everybody looked at me, looked at Doc. These are, these are Hall of Famers. These are Hall of Famers. Are oh, we rolling with Leon in? Bring it in. Boom. Brought it in. Doc looked at me before I broke the huddle. Don't let me down. <laughs> <laughs> and then I walked onto the court and did uh, Paul Pierce, KG, and Ray Allen. Young fella, you better make this. I said, man, way to encourage your young guy. Way to encourage me, okay? Way to encourage me, okay? So I, now I got to make this shot. But I end up making the shot, and we end up winning that game. Um, and every bucket had counted. But to be a role player, and, 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 and have to sit and wait sometimes, but then not pout, not get frustrated, not get angry, not get mad at your teammates, mad at coaches, and, and have your number called and you be ready for it. That's the most satisfying uh, factor of it all because you can come through big time for your team in a clutch situation and one of the key moments in, in NBA history. Yeah, especially in Celtics history as well. And I mean, obviously, yep. uh, you've kind of, you've spoken about Doc a lot, and you spoke about KG, uh, Paul Pierce, and Ray. Obviously, I mean, what was it like being around that 08 team? I mean, KG, obviously, we all know him as just yeah. the most intense guy ever doing press ups on the court. I mean, that's probably one of my favorite highlights of him. But yeah. what was it like being in that locker room with those guys just day after day, night after night, and just kind of being able to be around that kind of mentality? Yeah. Yeah, no, it was fun. It was fun. But you 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 see a winner's mentality. You see what it takes uh, to be an NBA great. You see what it takes to stay in the league, um, being around those guys. But you see what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. That's the most important thing. And when they come in early, leave late. We had KG staying late. He would beat everybody to the gym. KG said, man, don't let me beat y'all to the gym. He beat everybody to the gym in a full sweat, just before practice, ready to go, just before the games. Ready to go, Ray Allen. I tried to beat Ray Allen to the gym. I couldn't. I tried. I, I went five hours early for a game, and I thought I had him. I said, Ray, I'm going to beat you one of these games. I, it needed 82 games. I was like, Ray, I'm going to beat you one game. Ray said, no, you're not. You ain't going to beat me. You can't beat me to the game. You, you can't. It's impossible. I got five hours early. Ray was coming out the back already in the full sweat, reading the book. I said, what the? That, but but that's greatness. That's greatness, man. It's just mind blowing. And I was like, you know what? These guys putting in all this type of work, they already Hall of Famers. They don't have to do it. They got everything they need, but they love the game of basketball. And that's where I came in. And I, I love the game of basketball, no matter what. I play it for free, play it on the hardwood or I play it outside in a park. I don't care. And, and that's how, that's my mentality. So whoever was on the other side of the court, didn't really bother me like that, but going growing up in an environment under them um, was really cool because you just got to see how hard they worked. But it was fun, competitive, and 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 when you come to our practice, you came if you came to our practice, you couldn't tell we liked each other at all because it was so competitive. It was so competitive and so tough. Uh, you know, we all going at each other, and and that was the thing. We all had fun. We all had was competitive, but. We worked hard and we took our job seriously. I mean, I feel, I feel sorry for Doc trying to manage all those characters, to be honest. Uh, oh, yeah. We, <laughs> we had a few people. We had to get kicked out of practice a couple of times. It was, it's a lot of stuff was going on, man. So we, we it, it, it was good, though. It was, it was good competition. And, and Paul <laughs> Pierce, Paul Pierce started up something. He said, since y'all want to go at it so much because the bigs, we always have some built up animosity. We want to show where we the toughest, the biggest, the baddest out there. He came up with the G Unit runs, and I don't know if y'all know who G Unit is. G Unit was, uh, you know, back with uh, Fifty Cent in them. Tony, Tony Yayo, Lloyd Banks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, G Unit. So the G Unit runs was only for the biggest, the baddest, the toughest, and and, and it was no fouls. It was no ref, no fouls, and you got to score seven. 
by ones. And that's what we did every day after practice. Once Pete told us, you know what, we need to do these G unit runs. That'll help us out too. And we did it. And we got tougher, we got better. Medical staff must have been looking at you guys. Oh yeah. Going, oh, injury. Oh, <laughs> stop. No <laughs> fouls. There's no fouls. I've heard the stories about KG and calling himself the real silverback or something something crazy. But also it sounds like the intensity really kind of lifted on road trips um, and specifically plane trips. Have you got any notable stories from the plane trips with the 08 team? Man, we, we did all types of stuff on a plane trip. Man, we did everything. But, you know, me, I just like to stay out of it. You know, I was more like, I like I didn't like planes anyway, so I like to go to sleep and just wake up at the destination. Yeah. When I go, sometimes I come, to, I come back on the plane, they playing these games, Blu-ray and all that stuff. They paying all that stuff, right? They got, they, they paying for all type of money. That ain't my, that wasn't my thing. I'm a young guy. I wasn't doing that. And then, so we had all, everything going on. We was like, oh, who could beat somebody in a one-on-one? Who going at who, Tony Allen and Paul Pierce? Nah, we, I got you. I, I cook you every day in practice. What you talking about? All type of different stuff going on. And then we had an arm wrestling contest. It was it was crazy. Paul, I mean, not Paul. He wasn't in that. It was me, babe, Big Baby, and uh, KG. Um, as far as I can remember, that's who was in there. And we had that. And he's, and KG used to kind of say, man, y'all think I'm, I'm just skinny. Y'all think y'all can just, you know what I'm saying, can get me because I'm skinny, but I got strength. I got strength. That's what he used to always say. And um, he was like, all right, let's see it then. Let's see it. And literally, no, he he was strong. He he was strong. Uh, me, baby, and everybody. We was like, all right, he's, he's strong. Actually, he is. But I'm smart, though, because you know when you arm wrestle, right? And that's KG, you arm wrestling. And sometimes if you twist the wrong way, you can't break somebody's wrist. And there was a lot of big fools, uh, big people in here. And I didn't want to do that. So I didn't want to be the young guy that be like, you know what? I broke KG wrist. That wasn't <laughs> going to go over, go over well with Doc. That wasn't going to go over well with front office. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to y'all today because I wouldn't have been on that team. <laughs> no more. <laughs> but he was strong, no, he ended up winning the thing, but it, it was all love and fun, though. And it sounds as though your relationship with Doc, um, you you really kind of bought into the uh, Ubuntu uh, mindset and the team spirit that he tried to kind of foster across the group. Could you take us through your relationship with Doc and if that yeah, has kind well, of... Uh, yeah, yeah, no, Doc, Doc and I have a good relationship. Um, we had got off to a little shaky start i would say maybe not too shaky but it was that during that, that that losing year and um you know i wanted to play more you know like every player i wanted to play more we was losing we had a lot of young guys too as well trying to find their way when we get on the court um you know guys trying to shoot get they get their numbers up things like that which is understandable but in practice i was doing so well i just thought you know, maybe I get a, you know, I can get a shot because going down the stretch. And he gave me a few shots. I did real well, but I'm nothing consistent. So I was just like, you know, I was a little bit frustrated with that. So I had came to the conclusion in my head, in my mind, that I was like, you know what? Doc, Doc don't believe in me, I don't think. And when, when I think people don't believe in me, I take it to heart because, you know, I always overcome anything, um, force playing, uh, being not ranked before in high school to being top five in the country from not people saying I couldn't make it and uh, getting the cow, which I got in the cow Berkeley. People saying you ain't going to be a McDonald's all American because you came from foster care. I did that been, been a McDonald's all American. So see where I'm going with this. I always, I don't like when people doubt me a little bit and, and especially if I'm working hard, but doc wasn't doing that. And I didn't understand it as a young guy at first of, of his coaching methods. And um, so every time I seen Doc, I try to turn around like I seen a principal, like I was running out in the hallway and I wasn't supposed to be there. I turn and go the other way. And then one night um, I was in the practice facility. Uh, I seen Doc. He was in there for some. I don't know what he was doing in there, but I seen him in there. I try to turn around. And he said, Leon, come to my office. I said, oh, I said, what did I do? I didn't even do that. I didn't play last game, Doc. What did I do? <laughs> what did I do? And he said, come on, sit down. I was like, uh, yes, coach, uh, how you doing? Um, 
um, what's, what's, what seems to be the problem? Um, he's like, it's no problem, but I can see you getting a little frustrated, right? I was like, well, if we want to have this conversation, yes, I am. I, I feel that I should be playing more, not mentioning those names. I shouldn't be playing over guys and this and that. I don't do that. I just said, I, I feel like I can contribute to, to the team and, and help them win. And he was like, he was like, yeah, oh, I, I, I understand that. I think you can too. And he said, I said, and I told Doc, I was like, and you always yelling at me for stuff that I do in practice. I'm, I'm like, why? Like, why do you keep doing that? Because I'm thinking I'm doing a good job and this and that. He said, but you can always do it better. And when I, he said that, I was like, I can always do it better. He said, Leon, listen, you're going to help us win a championship one day. You can be like that role player. Uh, um, you could be like a Robert Roy. He come off and, and light stuff up. And not saying I was Robert Roy. Robert Roy did his thing. But light stuff up when he's called upon. He always responds. And when you call upon, you can respond similar in the same way or, or in a different fashion. And that's what he was saying. He told me that, but you won't help us win a championship one day after we had lost about 20, 30 games. <laughs> we only won like, I don't know how many games that year. And I was like, man, he said, I don't know if he's just telling me this, but and I like what he's saying. And then Doc said, imagine if I wasn't yelling at you. Was I, if, if I didn't say nothing to you, every practice now how would you feel think about it <laughs> and that's what he that's how he got over it. and that's how he got through to me and I was like oh I get it now I could do it better because if I come in this championship moments we have zero margin for error I can't be like I'm a half a second late but I was there I need to be there early and to help early and then get back and recover early so that's what he was talking about he broke it down to a T and then I bought in ever since after that it sounds like that's an example that you can share with young players. And is that yeah. something you've done ever since? I always do that. I share that with young players. I share what I have with young players too, because everybody, everybody wants the stuff to happen like right away. And, and what I tell people, and I do a little motivational speaking too as well. And I tell them that, you know, stuff don't happen right away all the time when you want it to happen. Sometimes it's later. I had injuries when I was a young in high school and, and I thought I was, everybody thought I was done for. But I was thinking to myself, you know what? It just probably wasn't meant to be at this time. But at a later time, I'm going to make sure it's meant to be because I'm going to work my butt off to make sure I get to the, get where I want to go. And with these young people, and that's what I try to tell them, like, if you're not getting run or if you if you are you coming off the bench, don't trip, don't worry about it. You know what? Worry about your job. Worry about what you can do to help the team in a good and helpful manner where you can shine, but the team can shine also. And once, when you do that, you won't get sidetracked. You won't get bothered by anything. You will just be prepared to do your job, learn, make sure you know all the systems, make sure you know what your team won't need from you and things like that. And that's what I did. And I told him like, I was on the floor with KG, Ray Allen, Paul Pierce. Do you think I want to grab the ball from Rondo, dribble it up, and then tell them to move out the way and shoot a three. Is that my game? No, that's not my game. But when I'm called upon, they tell me to go to work and they tell me to do it in the best way possible for the team. And I went to work. That's how I did it. And when I'm called upon, I go in the game and handle my business. And you know why? Because I knew what I was supposed to be doing, knew what how, what, what spots I was supposed to be in and, and knew what, kid, what Doc needed from me and what my teammates needed from me. I don't know about you, Nathan, but I want to run for a wall right now. Do you? <laughs> Head first. High, 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 highly motivational you probably, you probably stuff. Could, you probably could right now with your with your with your juiced up booster. Uh, <laughs> so I mean, you could probably take a lot of pain, but that's true. But you've got too many jerseys to you don't want to ruin them. I mean, to be honest, I've still not put them in the frame, so it's a bit lackadaisical for me. But it's uh, it, it, it is what it is. You're just waiting for that. You're just waiting for that Leon Poe. Jersey before yeah, I mean, there's you a, there's a space for it, Leon. There's a space for it. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it can be. It can, it can have a space up there. So it's, it can, I mean, look like it can. <laughs> I mean, we'll put you next. We'll put you next to Paul. We'll put you next to Paul. Yeah, yeah we'll start yeah. the shrine. We'll start the 08, the 07, 08 shrine. Yeah. But for, uh, sorry, yeah. go ahead, Nathan. I was going to say. I mean, obviously, we've spoken about you know, obviously, you with the with the, with the team at KG, etc. We've spoken about you um, specifically with that 08 series. Obviously. 
some other, well, most other fans obviously remember you as well for obviously your career high of 30 points, 11 rebounds, five blocks against Memphis in 09. Yeah. Steps in for KG. And obviously the game against the Nets in 08 where you dropped 27, Tony dropped 18 and Eddie dropped 10, which was yeah. an onslaught from the bench. I mean, for, I want to know, and I'm sure Josh wants to know as well, what, what has been your favourite performance in a Seas jersey? Like what's been the most satisfying for you? Whether it's something like your career high, the Lakers game, that's whole series, winning chip. Like, I mean, what has been your most satisfying yeah. game? Well, the, the most satisfying game, I'll give you two, two examples. The one was the championship series, uh, game two especially, because everything, no matter what I did uh, prior to that game, if I got in the game and didn't perform like I should have performed and everybody expected me to perform on my team, it had been all for nothing. And I looked at it that way. That's how I looked at it. So I thought that was just a critical, critical part of what, what what my journey was and, and, and what I was supposed to accomplish. Now, especially, especially with all the media, additional yeah, media coverage. Yeah, imagine if I went out there and laid a dud with the media coverage. Oh, I wouldn't have heard the last of it. <laughs> but I did. I was ready for the moment. But before that, I had to say KG. At, one year, of KG. I went out uh, for a period of time, and we was nine and one on that stretch. And um, that KG, uh, KG had went out, but we was nine and one. And then we had another 10 game trip. He wasn't going to be back into the probably the 11th game. And I was starting in his place and I held the fork down for us, um, you know, with other, all my other teammates and everything. And we went nine and one that year. We went nine and one, the same record when KG was in the game. And we lost to the same team when KG was in the game. But I held the fork down. I think I was I was I was most happy about that too because my teammates see they can count on me if something go wrong or in the season they can throw me in and I can get the job done. And all the ESPN and TNT games, I always perform. I always perform. It was something about those games that really got me going. So I always appreciate that because if I didn't perform in those big games, people wouldn't have been talking to me uh, talking about me. Um, going forward because they that's national TV and always, always like performing in those big games really made me happy that I was ready for those moments. So not, so it's not just national TV Rondo, it's national TV Leon Poe as well. At, I performed in every big game and mostly all of them on ESPN and TNT. It, I don't know. It's because, you know, it, it's just, it was just something that, that got me going. And when I was a young guy, I always, like to do good in those type of games when I got more eyeballs on me and everything. And then when I didn't have people in the gym like that, I still wanted to do good, but it was the opponent's people was trying to chase me and trying to wanted to do good against me. And I didn't want to let that happen either. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you step on the court, this is a bit, of a, a bit off topic, but I mean, I've heard loads of NBA players speak about it. Like once they step on the court, they don't hear the arena. They don't hear the crowd. It kind of no. Really kind of feel like you're back in your hometown just on your home little court outside yeah. that be in the park or whether that be in the in your you know, your, your local uh, sports center we call it um or arena and yeah. your own. is that kind of what it feels like is that you know for you was that what it was like or is it no that's that's definitely what it was like um especially when i step on these arenas especially the road games the home games once you get into the game, you'll hear from the start, you know, when you're ready to go, you hear all the crowd noise. Then once that ball get thrown in the air, get tipped, uh, you get it, that it goes kind of like silent. And, and, and like you said, it goes back to, you know, I'm just playing in the park. I'm just in the playground. But I got Kobe on one end. I got KG on with me on this way. I got Paul Pierce here. We got um, Allen Iverson over there. It's just, it was just, you know, so surreal like that. You, if you look at it that way, but when you're on the court, I just looked at it as I got to do my job. I got a guy in front of me. I got to make sure I can't let him get the best of me today. I need to do the best I can for my team. And I never heard the crowd noise. You only hear the crowd noise in the end. If that's what you, if you really focus in on the game, you will only hear the crowd noise when it's fourth quarter and it's close and it's time for winning. You will hear the crowd noise then. And like my game two, I heard the crowd when I went to the free throw line. Everything opened back up when I went to the free throw line when they was chanting my name. And I started to look around and look, and I was looking, and I still had the ball. The ref was looking at me counting 10 seconds. It's about to be a 10 seconds. 
And that's the time I heard the crowd and I heard and I was like, oh man, this is crazy. This is a crazy atmosphere. But I had to shoot the free throws, got back, snapped back out of it, shot the free throws, got back on D. But it's a fun, it's a good atmosphere, fun, surreal moment, like I said. But you don't usually hear the crowd like I didn't usually hear the crowd at the start or I didn't have the crowd in the middle, but I heard it in the start and at the end. So in that moment, the final moment where you've managed to kind of reconnect with the crowd, was Boston a special place to win for you? I know that um, it has a rich reputation, a rich history. Was that the case for you? Yes, it, it was a special place to win. Uh, knowing that history, Larry Bird, uh, Bill Russell, uh, have everybody, man, everybody. Kept, uh, um, Robert Parrish, everybody that's been here, that's been through here. Um, it's the history. It's what it is. You know all the championships. You know uh, they kind of like saved the lead, kept the lead afloat during those times. And Bird Magic really took it to another level, and and, and things like that. So you know all the history. You know all the history, especially when we was playing against the Lakers too. But when you win here, it's special. It's very special because the fans know what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. They're very passionate uh, about their sports team. And they expect excellence out of everybody, but also they expect a hundred percent hustle on the court too. It's not just about scoring buckets. It's not just about being the best player on the floor. It's about doing those little things to help your team win out here. And that's what I noticed about these Boston fans, uh, uh, Celtics fans, that that's what they love. They love that. They love that extra effort you give and uh, to try to help your team win. And that was much appreciated for me. And I much appreciate the fans from recognizing that, that I gave that effort every night. I think yeah. as well, that was obviously the fact where it was the Lakers that we beat. So that's obviously as a Celtics fan, that is the, uh, always the ultimate cherry on the top of the cake as well. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, I mean for anybody who doesn't know that relationship has continued for you, hasn't it, with the organization in a kind of multitude of different roles? Uh, what's your yeah. what, what has been your relationship with the Celtics over the past few years? Yeah, no, I've been here for a little bit now. Um, right now, I'm, the, I'm one of the team ambassadors. Um, and like I said, I do motivational speaking too as well for them. But I also uh, speak on their behalf time to time. We do a lot of stuff in the community, a lot of stuff in the community uh, for us with these kids, trying to help them out much as I can um, and try to give them a good experience, give them some good advice uh, from the whole Celtics organization down to me. And, and, and we've been doing that uh, last four or five years. Um, it's been going real good. Um, and, and the kids really been getting good stuff, good information, and also been getting um, computers, uh, equipment, things like that to build their projects uh, for school, books, backpacks, and it's been it's been fun. It's been great. Always here for me me to get the satisfaction for me is that you can give back to these kids, give back to the communities, um, and then whoever want advice and, and and think they might need to come up to me, or I might walk in the building that day and give some advice. Like kids come up, or or uh, teenagers, or even grown people come up. Man, we needed to hear that today uh, from you. And like I tell everybody, sometimes you. You won't always start at the top. You won't. Sometimes you got to work your way up, and that's okay. If you work your way up, you you just fine. And like I did, I said I seen baby steps. Baby steps was in my grades. Baby steps on my on the basketball court, and then it gradually picked up and picked up as I went on and as I started learning more and as I was more receptive to trying to um, create something out of my life and, and create something special. So I told them they can do the same thing. I didn't just, I wasn't born just always big and can shoot the ball or dribble and dunk and all that. I had to work at different things, I had to work at it. And, and if you, if they work at it, that's why I tell them if they work at it, they can do anything they want to do. And they got to believe that no matter who says what around you, you got to believe it. And that's what I preach. 
So you still have that existing relationship with the club. Um, it, yeah. sound, it sounds like it's really rewarding from a motivational speaking point of view, especially. Um, but you're also, um, I've seen you, when I've been on my visits, I've seen you on game night. What's your game night um, responsibility? Yeah, sometimes on game nights I come in, um, I'll talk to some of our business partners and things like that, um, do some suites and stuff, go and visit a couple of people's suites. Um, talk to them about the different different stuff of the game. People like to ask me questions about the 08 team, of course, and uh, sometimes business questions, sometimes, most of the times, basketball stuff, and then about the current team and the situation and things like that. It's just it's just, it's just pretty much fun for me. And, um, you know, get to interact with the fans, with business partners, uh, and, and, and try to funnel along, you know, the Celtics mission. Well, well, on the current team, there's been a lot of change in the organisation, obviously, over the last few months. Um, do you feel as though there's a vibe within the club that uh, things are starting to settle down a little bit now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good vibe in the club. But, you know, we, we right now we're going through COVID stuff. You know, everybody's battling it. The whole NBA is battling it um, <laughs> and, and losing players left and right. But like I said, it's, it's a mentality is that, you know, next man up and we got to have that mentality. It's not always going to be pretty. And so that's what, you know, we've been battling over here, um, trying to be next man up uh, or type of guys. And when when our numbers call, we go in there, we do our job and we perform. And what what this team needs is a little bit of consistency, you know, and and if we can find that because we had guys in and out of the lineup, we still got guys in and out of the lineup. Um, but if we can get to a point where we can play a little consistent uh, for a long stretch of time, I think we'll be better for the long run. But right now, you got to do what you got to do. You got to play who you got to play and, and and get the most out of those guys as much as possible because it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be pretty. Winning games, trying to win, trying to make the playoff, trying to win the championship is not easy. Everybody uh, can't be 30-plus point scores a night. Some people got to go in and step, step in and do the little dirty work like Grant Williams do for, for the Celtics now. Hit the corner three, get the scrap, loose balls, guard the best players and stuff like that. We need you to guard a guard. We need you to guard a big. And just say, yes, coach, and, and, and go out there and do your best. And that's what we have. And that's what we're trying to build. We're trying to build that all the way up and build it into consistency. That's all throughout the season. But it's been a strange one so far. And we'll see how the rest of the season goes. You, you mentioned Grant Williams already, and there's been a couple of games where it's been clear that he's eaten his frosted flakes that morning. Uh, yeah. are, there, are there any other role players you feel as though have that kind of ability to kind of, let's use your name as a verb here, to their ability to Leon Poe? Yeah, man. Um, we, it's, it's a lot of players that, that stepped up for us in, in, in different moments. Um, and things like that. And, and, and I know Peyton Pritchard haven't been getting that much run as he would like, but it's okay because when he stepped in the other night, he did real well. And that's what you got to do. I think he's one of those guys uh, that can do it. We got a, we got a few other guys that can shoot the ball real well, but it's just going to be when you, when you go in the game, you don't know if your number's going to get called, but if you go in the game, you do your best. You do what you do best and help the team and try to help the team win. No matter if you didn't play uh, last five games, if you get in the game, don't pout. And we got a lot of them guys that they don't pout. They, they like to play. They love to play. Um, and, 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 and also uh, ready to work like Josh Richardson too. He, he gets in the game. He gives those sparks all the time. Um, a very solid, solid player, veteran, and really someone you can rely on. And all our team, the, all the players uh, adapted to that. They always step up when need be. It's just about us finding the rhythm uh, with the coaching staff, with the players and everybody, getting everybody on the same page in the rhythm and trying to play with some consistency and send some urgencies down the stretch and fourth quarters and things like that. Excellent. And what's your read so far on Ime as a head coach? Uh, have you gotten had any time to get to know him? Uh, I didn't get to know him yet. Uh, I spoke to him a couple of times, uh, just passing by um, because of the whole situation. And so, but he's a, I already know him as a player and when he was a player and things like that. Good dude, uh, very, very good person. And um, 
you know, you somebody you want to lead your team and try to make sure they can figure out their way to find their way through the wilderness and get and come out on top, come out, get get into the playoffs and try to go take them far as he can. But you got to teach. You got to be patient. And I think he got the uh, right attitude by teaching and being patient uh, with a play, with these players. He's a first year head coach. We know that. But um, we know he's fit for the job because, uh, you know, you know, Boston, they don't hire nobody if you ain't fit for the job out here because this is a tough job and it's not easy. And I think he's very well uh, respected in that locker room. And I, what I've seen from them guys and, and playing on the court, especially the people that he's – some guys didn't get in the last two games. The last three games they got in there, they played hard. Aaron Neesmith, you know what I'm saying? It, it's, it's really good shooting threes and playing defense as well. But I look at him, he's diving on the floor, and sometimes he don't even play, but he's firing up for his teammates. And that shows you if your team is doing that and teammates are doing that for their coach, that means they believe in him. And I think they do. And I think they all behind him. And we can't wait to see where it go. We just got to navigate this crazy season right now to try to do the best we can to put the best possible product out there on the floor. Yeah. So obviously, I know we've, we've got such a young core, obviously, in Jalen and Jason. Yeah. Um, I mean, in your opinion, I mean, what, what does this team need to do to take that next step into, you know, getting up into a championship contender? You know, what, what, what if you were... If well, you're in there now, in, in, in amongst them, what would you want to see from them? What would you expect yeah. that they need to do? Yeah, well, for me, from my perspective, um, I always got a label. Of, uh, uh, I label different teams, right? I watch games. I like labeling the teams. All right, this is an offensive juggernaut. Uh, this is a defensive juggernaut. Uh, what, what, this team can score on anybody. So they ain't going to have no problem scoring. So now with our team, with the Celtics, I see them as a great defensive team. And I think if they can really put their minds to being great on defense, night in and night out, no matter if their shots falling or not, I think that's what can ride the wave all the way to where they want to go. Now, if we revert back to thinking we are, we are an offensive team, which we can score, you know, the Celtics, they can score. But you want to be a defensive team first. I think with this particular personnel, defensive team first, Offense gonna come second because we got some some of the uh, two uh, two of the best scorers that they, they can score the ball and Jalen and um, Jason can score the ball, but we got to make sure it's in the team oriented system. A game, the game plan works around everybody, and and we need to utilize everybody. But it's defense first. I think you can hang your hat on defense, and if they do that, I think that's gonna take them far. Now, if they think they are offensive team and they have to play defense second. We're not going to go very far, and you'll see it, uh, if that happens. But I think they need to play defense a little bit um, and take on that defensive mentality like my OA team did, even if we didn't score points. And sometimes we had 80 points. But guess what? You had 75. Guess what? We still won the game. Everybody, every, It's a win-win for us. We still won. Everybody felt good because we were able to stop somebody. But we had – hungry people on the defensive end that really wanted to stop somebody, didn't really care too much about offense. As long as we got the stops, whoever get the credit, get the credit, whoever get the shots, get the shots. We didn't care. Yeah, and I, I mean, think that's what they got to do. Yeah, because I mean, at the moment, obviously, the, with all the talk of can Jason and Jalen play with each other, like the interesting fact that, you know, me and Josh spoke about um, yeah. our last episode we, was the fact that, you know, with – you know, we may be slightly down on offense when they when they both play together, but on defense with Jalen in the lineup, we're a lot better defensively. One of the best, you know, within within the league. So it's it's it goes to show that they can do. It's just it's just that uh, I, we're not sure. We're, none of us are fully. To be fair, me personally, I think they can, and I think they work really well. And they just need one more piece between yeah. them just to synergize them, and that's it. I mean, that's. I that. think- yeah, I think I think that they work well together. I don't know where this narrative came from. Uh, yeah, I where Jalen and, and Jason Tatum can't play together because they went to the Eastern Conference Finals how many times? How many times? Uh, yeah, like like two or three, three, <laughs> four. Three, three, yeah. <laughs> it was about three, right? Yeah, yeah. And so they and the stats don't even show that they don't they can't play together. The stats show that they play well together. It's just about 
are lackluster fourth quarter sometimes, the third quarter set coming out lackadaisical. We got to come together as a unit. And that's what the whole problem concerned me is you got to come together and want to fight every single night for every hitch, not just because we playing a bit, a team that uh, are we playing the Lakers or just because we playing um, Durant or just because we playing uh, uh, James Harden, Steph Curry, things like that. No, you got to want to fight when we play Houston, when we play Oklahoma City, when we play, we got to get in a dog fight. And that's what I think we got to make it. I don't, I don't buy into the, 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 they can't play together. That's not me. I think they can play together. They bring two different things to the game and they both wing defenders. Um, Jason has uh, been doing a, a great job of, of defending lately as well. He's been long and, and out there and athletic getting in his stands. And, and you know, Jalen Brown has always been that. So I think you got something there, but I think we got to put it together. And you know, time is ticking and time is ticking. And that's what that's what everybody is is looking at. Yeah, I mean, you saw it last night as we speak. Uh, we're just after a loss to Philadelphia, and what Philadelphia definitely do know with their star in Embiid is even without Simmons, they knew who they were in that last fourth quarter. Yeah, um, it's about basically you touched on it with labeling teams. What Boston needs to do is they need to make, make it absolutely unmistakable who they are. And that's what that's the next step yep. for them, isn't it? I know that it's not quite there yet, but Mm-mm. even though time's ticking, the best player is 23 years old. The, yeah. You know, the, so, so, so relatively young team, but the next step is ensuring that we definitely have that kind of set identity and nobody knows a Celtics team having a strong identity more than you, Leon, because of your yep. experience. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and yeah, I just, that's what I do believe, man. They do have to have that set identity. And I really think this team will be at best, will be best on the defensive end. If they, if we, if the team come out thinking they, they all three point shoes, which I'm not knocking three pointers. I love them. I like them. I like when they go in, but, we can't. Sometimes we shoot 30, 40, maybe 50 threes. Sometimes I think that's a little too much. I think we need to hang our hat on the defense and get out and transition and run a little bit more, try to not play in a half court as much and, and, and get some easy buckets. And But hang your hat on the defensive end and make sure you lock up and you all connect it as one. We can't have – you see the great defensive teams in the league. When one person leaves a spot, Sometimes the offensive player think it's wide open. But nine times out of ten, when we see they think it's wide open, they go. It closes immediately. It shuts down because the next man rotated over early, already there, took that person place. The person that re- that uh, got out of there, that's already – they scrambled back and took their man. And it's set. Now you're back in your normal defense. You can't do nothing. That's how – that's what I want the Celtics to get to that next step and make sure they understand each other on the defensive end. And they was, they was, they hit a little defensive stride too. That was looking real good uh, this season. So we just got to make sure we keep that up and get back to it and making sure we make that our main focus. I mean, Ime said all of the right stuff before the season about being a kind of defense, defense first, defense led team playing with pace. And that yeah. obviously suits the personnel. So it's about really playing to the personnel, yeah. as you mentioned. Uh, yeah. So fingers crossed they can do that. Um, but I am wary that we don't want to take too much of your time, Leon. I'm really, really honoured that we got a chance to form our own podcasting version of the G Unit. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'll speak on behalf of Nathan here, but it's been an absolute pleasure for us to have you. Oh, man. Thank you all for having me. UK, what's up, baby? Whole love, y'all. Always, man. You're always welcome with me, man. So. Holla at me anytime. Really Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. And obviously as well, before we go, we do it with every guest. They have to give us their best British accent. So, oh, I mean... I, 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 I know yo, that's what you all going to try to get out of me, but I, <laughs> I can't do that, man. I, I, I respect and love that accent so much. I'm not going to mess that up. I cannot <laughs> do it. I don't want nobody mad at me for messing their accent up. Because I'm not going to do that, though. Because I, I don't have it, but I do love it. I will say one thing. I watch a lot of movies in that accent. That's a good accent, man, that I love and I like, man. 
Well, you know but what? I can't do it. You know what? We we do give exceptions to champions. I was going to so say because man, you have that ring that. on your finger, we, yeah. we can get away with it. Pre- appreciate that, but I I don't want to mess up that net, that at all. That's 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 <laughs> that's sacred, man. That's sacred. I don't want I don't want that be playing back <laughs> when I'm 60 years old. I don't want that playing back because well, it's going it's not going to be a good sight. <laughs> hopefully we'll get you back on one day and i mean yeah one thing we'll give you a little bit of homework if you go watch downton abbey uh that is probably you know just start practicing the posh accent i mean next time you come on we'll get you to- <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> all right y'all man. it's been real man appreciate y'all thanks for having me really? and i hope y'all have a blessed holidays too as well so i'll see y'all next time happy holidays champ yeah thank you here's leon all right so josh how was that man that was good great to meet the champ um as always it's like jarring even though i know it's coming no matter who is on the podcast you introduce me as the basketball ass (laughs) and and when it's an NBA champion for my favourite team ever, it makes it even funnier. Because no matter who it is, like, you will see me on every interview. I will go like that. As though I don't know it's coming. But with Leon, I basically had to. It's mandatory that I had to be like, what's that all about? You know, I'm, you can't act too silly around <laughs> a member of the 08 Boston Celtics. But I mean, to be honest, I mean, I didn't. I mean, I was watching your face. I didn't quite look at get to get to look at Leon's face as I said it. So it'd be interesting to see when we uh, when we put it out what his reaction was to basketball ass. I, I mean, I could assume every guest is probably looking at us going, "Fuck you know, what have we, what have I what have, what have we got ourselves in for here? Uh, what is going on on this podcast?" So, which member of the G unit do you want to get in next? Uh, out of the the O eight bigs, James Posey. I mean. Obviously, eventually you've got to aim for Kevin Garnett, but he's a movie star now. Um, That's the problem. I mean, we can... Glenn Davis, let's get Big Baby on. We can try. We can try. We'll, we'll do our absolute best. I mean, to be honest, I mean, the absolute... I don't know, who, who would be your absolute ideal Oh wait, so to have on? Like, who would be your ideal? I mean, my my favourite player of my lifetime is Paul Pierce. So. Exactly. It, just, it just it simply has to be Paul Pierce. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. Uh, to be honest, I think I, it was just it was just awesome just to speak to uh, to one of the champs. I mean, it was yeah, that was uh, that was cool. That was cool. as long as he's not having one of his poker nights, we should be able to get him on an off day. Mate, that'd be awesome if he has poker nights. I mean, imagine, <laughs> imagine, imagine the backdrop. <laughs> A live podcast from from Monica or whoever it was that yeah. Well, anyway, let's not get into that. It was tremendous. Honest, speaking to Leon was great. Um, you can tell really why he's gone into motivational speaking as well. Oh, I can't get that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've taken it in a serious direction now. Uh, the uh, This step makes sense, though, for Leon, doesn't it? Because I, I know I joked about like wanting to run through a wall, but he just had that uh, kind of natural leadership in his voice. I know that uh, there weren't many situations in the NBA where he would be considered a team leader, um, but you can tell he's got a leader's mentality that he's taken into ventures after his professional career. Yeah, I mean, I do find, I mean, obviously I, I picked up on that as well. And it's the same with, I don't know, when you when you look at stories about KG and all that. I mean, that's I think that's the kind of character or the kind of mentality that quite a lot of this modern, you know, NBA at the moment misses. Mm-hmm. You don't have those characters like KG. You don't have those characters like you know, like Leon with that you know strong mentality. Like, you, I mean, obviously within our team at the moment, you've got the dog who is Marcus Smart. But I mean, c- can you name a player off the top of your head in the NBA currently who has that pure and you know when when he speaks, someone listens? Do you know what I mean? One, I can I can name one. Draymond Green. Draymond Green is the one. He just talks nonsense most of the time, doesn't he? But it, no, yeah. he knows he knows his onions. He knows his onions. But there, there's a handful, um, and but just not many as kind of fiercely enigmatic as Kevin Garnett, uh, a true character. And it was great to hear more stories about him, but just mainly about 
Leon's experience uh, being part of such a special team. So honoured to be part of it and honoured to be with you again, Nathan. Oh, Jesus. We get, we're going deep now. We're going deep. It's getting around Christmas time, so everyone gets emotional, don't they? So, <laughs> ho ho ho! I know, but honestly, that was that was that was such a good episode, and hopefully, you guys listening or watching are going to really enjoy it. So, yeah, I mean, I think we should end it there. Otherwise, we just go into a rant and we end up talking about loads of other stuff. Well, so, I've got the perfect sign off. All right, you got the perfect sign off. So, so you do your thing, and then I'm going to jump in. Okay, so guys, that is it. Obviously, remember to like, share and subscribe to the podcast. Obviously, me and Josh are going to be putting everything on YouTube now as well. And there is a dedicated YouTube. But by now, by the time this goes out, there will be a dedicated YouTube. So make sure you look at uh, my Instagram um, bio or my Twitter bio. Anyway, you're going to be able to find it. Make sure you subscribe to it. And yeah, Josh, all the basketball ass, as everyone knows now. Um, I'm going to have to get you a mug and you have to put it in your background saying basketball ass. But anyway, Josh, sign us off. So happy holidays to everybody. I hope you have a wonderful festive season. So, and there just kind of remains one more thing to say, and that's po, po, po. Merry Christmas. Until... Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, guys. Peace.